Father, we stand in your presence by means of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit, thankful for this access into your presence, thankful for the wonders of your grace and the greatness of your love, so very thankful that you've given us the privilege to gather together in this special way to worship you and to feast upon your word. We pray for those in difficult circumstances. May they know the peace of God that passes understanding. And may they rest, they find their rest in you. We pray for our country and for our leaders. We're so thankful for the liberty which permits us to worship you in freedom. We pray for this small gathering of believers. We're thankful that you've led us together and you've given us the privilege to study your word. May the Holy Spirit be the only one who teaches us, filtering out all the foolishness and the ignorance, but sealing to our hearts the truth of thy word. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at blessedhopeforever.com. It's difficult. It really is. It's, it's hard for me to put into words just how wonderful I think it is to to gather together here and to feast upon God's Word. I become disheartened every time I listen to Christian radio when I'm driving. One of the, the favorite verses that they bring up is all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, yet strangely I don't hear them quote the words that follow. Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus. This book is not a, a collection of uh, special phrases. We have the greatest privilege in the world to feast upon this book. The Lord's given us an opportunity to study this book together as a body of believers. You don't have to agree with me uh, on anything. Nobody's asking you to, to agree with anything other than the truth of this book. We study it together. And nobody has a, a corner on truth. It bothers me a lot to realize that, that, that what I teach is, is surely mixed with error. And, and I praise the Lord that there are those of you out there who study this book, who love the Lord, who want to know the truth as badly as I do. And, and I, I appreciate emails and, and criticisms and, and comments. I want to know what this book says. There are things that are taught on this channel where most of the Christians that you know, uh, would they would call it heresy. And if it's heresy, folks, I want to know it. I don't want to teach you that which isn't true. And in every one of these videos, our, our attention is directed to this, uh, to this book, uh, verse by verse, uh, so that we are uh, essentially, so that essentially we stay in context. The one disadvantage is that I don't go f fast enough to really cover what, what some people might call the, the syntax of the passage. But we're looking at these verses of Scripture and we're remembering what came before and we look ahead to what comes after. We've been studying together in the first, uh, in first John uh, chapter 2 and uh, we're in the vicinity of verse 7. You know, I think that there's probably more problems, you know, among many ministers in First John than almost any other portion of God's Word because there always seems to be implied there that the fact that you can't be a Christian without doing a lot of stuff. And, and that, in fact, is, uh, that is the great movement in Christianity today away from what people call conservative Christianity. In my mind, conservative Christianity says that you were a sinner, that you were not seeking God, working for God, you weren't worshiping God. In fact, on the other hand, you were hating God and Christ died 
in your place. He didn't die in your place because you uh, deserved it, nor was there anything in you that was attractive to him. He didn't like you better than, than, than somebody else. There wasn't some merit involved in his choosing you. It's just that he loved you because you were his child. He chose you in Christ before the foundation of the world, so it, it could not be based upon anything you do, and, and that was conservative Christianity. God did it by grace. You're saved by means of faith. You know, there, there was always the argument, you know, uh, you know, whose faith, you know, yours or Christ, and most of you know that I have strongly taught and I strongly believe that it's the faithfulness of Jesus Christ that gives you faith uh, to trust in that faithfulness. And so your exercise of faith is, is intimately connected with the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. And that was conservative theology. But today, even the greatest seminaries say that, well, if there's not any works, there probably wasn't any faith when the Word says whoever confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. Many of you know I, I live in a very conservative part of the country. I don't know if you could call it the Bible Belt or not. It, I used to think it was. But I, I seldom hear one thing taught that it is what I would call biblical truth, except that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, that God Almighty became incarnate, and, and those people are my brothers and sisters in Christ. All who confess that Christ has come in the flesh is of God. Now, now does that mean that they belong to God? I, I really don't know. It's not my job to judge, but if we took the, the brightest theologian that you ever heard of and the dumbest Christian that you ever met, the difference between them com compared to our, our difference to God is infinite. Brethren beloved is brethren. Uh, I think you, if you're looking at your, the King James Version, it, re, it starts out brethren. Actually, the word is beloved. I want you to take note of that. I, uh, I'll, I'll talk more about that. I write no new commandment unto you, but an old commandment which you had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you've heard from the beginning. Uh, verse 8, again, a new commandment I write unto you, which thing is true and in you, because the darkness is past and the true light now shines. That's, that's not brother. That's not a Delphos brethren. It is... Uh, it's from the word agape. It's it's apagate, uh, agape toy. It's a derivative of, of 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 love. It's it's beloved. The word is beloved. It's not brethren. Beloved is the true uh, true reading. First John two seven. Uh, from the beginning, the time when you first heard the gospel of Christ, before the, the, the apostles even wrote. When we get over to, to the next chapter, 1 John 3.11, and I really kind of hate jumping ahead, but I can't help it here. For this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. The commandment was old, folks. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Uh, we see that in uh, the 19th chapter of Leviticus. It was part of the Mosaic Law. But now it's new. The standard is new. Even as I loved you, even as he, as he also walked, you know, and, and the motive is new because God so loved us. We get over to the fourth chapter of 1 John. It's beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. Again, a, a new commandment I write unto you, namely with regard to your loving one another, a commandment which is true in him and in you. The new commandment is, is the same, love. Back in the sixth verse of this chapter, you know, we were told that we ought to walk even as he walked. I spent some time talking about that. 
And this instruction is built, is, it really stands upon the shoulders of, of the fact that we're not under law, but we're under grace. And so we're looking at the new man here, not the old. And, and as Christ laid down his life for his people, we ought to lay down our lives for one another. That's, there's a real sacrifice of, on our part, not, not, not in a law sense, but, in, but we lay down our lives. We, we've been crucified with Christ. It's all about Christ, not self. Because the darkness has passed and the true light now shines. The true light came. And that true light was our Lord Jesus Christ. He returned to the Father, but darkness was overcome. The light remains in us. A, a new dispensation has begun, is how I would interpret that. And, and to walk as Christ walked. A new commandment, because to love one another was in the law of Moses, but to love one another as Christ love us, loved us, well, was, was the new commandment. The commandment of love. John 13, uh, the Gospel of John uh, 13, 34, a new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. And by this all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one uh, toward another. This commandment is fulfilled in walking as Christ walked, uh, uh, the fifth chapter of Ephesians, if you, many of you followed us through Ephesians chapter 5, the first two verses, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear, dear children, and walk in love as Christ also has loved us, and has given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. Verse 8, again, a new commandment I write unto you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is past and the true light now shines. And we come to verse 9. He that says he's in the light and hates his brother is in darkness even until now. Verse 10, he that loves his brother abides in the light. Okay. Okay. He that loves his brother abides in the light, and there's no, no occasion, none occasion of stumbling. Uh, that is, the cause of stumbling is not in him. I'm, I'm going to talk a little more about that word stumble uh, here. But he that hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and knows not whether he goes because that darkness has blinded his eyes. And so many Christians look at this as, as well, it's talking about a believer versus a non-believer or uh, it's uh, and, and I don't believe that that's what it's talking about at all we're looking at a context dearly beloved which deals with love as it regards our fellowship with God and with one another and our loving one another in Christ uh, I don't see the non-believer anywhere in this passage at all so we love one another because Christ loves us. We've all received the same grace. We've all partaken of the same spirit, the same spiritual baptism. I mean, on and on it goes. Uh, there's what what did First uh, Corinthians four verse seven? For who make it? What did you receive that, that they haven't? Uh, is what I'd I'd say. For who makes thee to differ from another? And what hast thou that thou didst not receive? Now if thou didst receive it, why dost thou glory as if thou hadst not received it? Uh, Philippians 1.7, we went through that wonderful book of Philippians. In verse 7 of chapter 1, Paul states, You are all fellow partakers of grace with me. Okay? Dearly beloved, no wonder here in this chapter, no wonder the Holy Spirit is, is, is teaching us, has been teaching us about substitution, propitiation, uh, that, that God is fully satisfied uh, with Christ's work on our behalf. 
that uh, Christ our advocate, uh, light being the truth of his word, uh, the basis of our fellowship uh, with him and one another, uh, love, grace, the new man. Uh, we're, gonna, that's, we're really going to see that in the next chapter. As opposed to the old man, the flesh, law, which in which I've, I've pointed out numerous times. You know, the flesh profits nothing. I think that the more that we come to walk in the truth of God's Word, the more we are likely, if we're not careful, to look down on our brother. I think that it is my personal belief, you don't have to agree with me, that those of us who are the most under grace tend to be, at times, the most critical. Verse 9, he that says he's in the light and hates his brother is in darkness even until now. And people read that and they immediately say, see, he that hates his brother is going to hell. Dearly beloved, I don't think, I, I, I hope that you don't, you don't believe that. You know, look, wait a minute. They're brothers. They're in the same family. Okay? Slow down. Read this carefully. They're brothers. They're beloved. First one. Well, Steve, are you trying to tell me that somebody who belongs to God, redeemed by the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, can hate some other, some other person who was redeemed by the shed blood of Jesus Christ? Absolutely. Absolutely. There are those who are, are really interested in the truth of this book. There are those who are not. There's, there are those who really love studying this book, but who are not, they're not a part of, a, of, of that great move away from the sovereignty of God, the, the depravity of man, the finished work of Christ, to where it is almost universally accepted today that our being born from above by the will of God is is got to be coupled with something. Okay, water baptism, a service of some kind, uh, some kind of fruit. And so we've moved away from Scripture only, Christ only, grace only, faith only. Okay? I want you to take careful note of what we're looking at here because I believe it's a, it, is a, it is extremely important that we get this right. I absolutely believe that there are some very enlightened Christians that are, that are filled with bitter criticism against other Christians. And folks, I don't want to do that. You know, and I, and I sit and I, I listen to sermons and I, and I think, you know, I, you know, I'd, I'd just love to be there just to tell them how wrong they are. Tell them, you know, that they really haven't comprehended all that Christ did for them. You know, they're, they're spending all of their time telling these poor Christians what they need to do if they want to go to heaven. You know, here's a man, a guy on the radio who I'm listening to driving down the highway, who by his own profession knows the same Lord that I do. He's not teaching the truth. As I, as I understand it. Okay. But he knows the same Lord that I do. And I have no doubt I'll see him in heaven. I know Satan raises messengers as messengers of light. I understand that. Okay? And he may be one of those. But I doubt it from the way that he, that I, that he taught. I think he was a brother in Christ. How do you go to heaven? Oh, well, you got to recognize that Jesus Christ is God. you you got to recognize you're a sinner you, you, you got to confess that sin you got to be sorry for it uh, and you know you, you must come to christ and acknowledge him as lord of your life and and then you got to be water baptized and i think i think if if you're making all these conditions i mean if you're presenting all that as conditions on on whether or not we go to heaven then I, I have to I have to vehemently agree, disagree, okay? To to say heaven is a result of what you do, 
I believe that to be absolutely anti-scripture, anti-biblical. But I, I think I do love these people. It's, it's hard for me to understand these people. It's hard for me to understand how a Christian who has the Word of God, who recognizes that Christ came in the flesh, you know, doesn't want to study this book very much, and looks down on doctrine. Well, I don't have any need for doctrine. I just, you know, certainly doesn't have any use for what I believe. But folks, should we step out of light into darkness and hate our brother because of that? Absolutely not. We walk in the light. We walk in the light and the blood of Jesus Christ keeps on cleansing us from all sin. I, I believe it's the new man that walks in the light. And we have fellowship one with another. We have fellowship with, with God and with Christ. But he that says he's in that light, that truth, and hates his brother is in darkness even until now. And I'm going to suggest this is not a brother, it's not a person going to hell here. Okay? This is our brother. Darkness, folks, does not mean that he's headed to, for hell. Folks, I read a lot of articles. I, I, read, I read articles from very conservative seminaries. Many, some of these were my former uh, professors in Bible college. And I read articles from these folks who understand, they understand the deity of Christ, the finished work of Christ, the sovereignty of God the depravity of man, the total sufficiency of the work of Christ. And I am amazed at the hateful things that they say about others who also belong to God because they don't, because they don't believe what they believe. And dearly beloved, I am not a proponent of error. If, you, if you've watched this channel, you know that. Nor am I a proponent, uh, a, a proponent of ignorance, but, but these are God's people. Folks, to hate them goes contrary to the very message of grace that we teach. We can and, and should absolutely hate the world religious system based on human merit. That's the world that, that, that Christ said would, would hate them and, and for them not to love. Do not, not love the world, nor the things in the world. The context is that religious system which will put them to death thinking they're doing God a service. We can and we should hate that system based on human merit without hating those who are trapped within it. But I believe we can for certain do that, do just that. God has a lot of children. If he's given you the privilege, if he's given you the opportunity to know more and more of his word, it seems to me that that carries with it a greater responsibility to love those who don't know as much as you do. You know, years ago I was asked to preach... Uh, at a church in Albuquerque, uh, New Mexico. I was a lot younger then, and, and I preached, and this little old lady, you know, she came up, tears running down her cheek, and she said, Sir, I've heard more about the blood of my Savior this morning than I've heard in the last 40 years. You know, and I look back on that, and I, I'm embarrassed at my first response. And that was, you know, well, how in the world could you have never heard of these things? What she needed was love. She was God's child, I'm sure. He that says he's in the light. How can you hate a brother for whom Christ died? Where did we ever get the idea that Christ couldn't have died for these people? Okay. You know what, we just think Christ only died for us smart folks, you know. this. Smart. How can we hate someone for whom Christ died? He that, says, he that says he's walking in the light and hates his brother is in darkness. Dearly beloved, if you understand this book, you can't hate someone for whom Christ died. They might, they might not know as much as you. They may know more than you, but you can't hate them. 
But there are Christians who do. Christians are capable of doing both. I believe that we're not looking at a contrast between two separate, entirely different individuals here. Okay? Dearly beloved, listen to me. I believe that what we're seeing in this passage is us. Either going one way or another. I have known theologians who are giants in theological truth who are walking in darkness. I have known times in my life in which I walked in darkness. And folks, I am not for teaching biblical error. I don't want to lead people astray. I do not want to lead you people astray. My challenge to you, for all of the time that I've been here on this channel, is study this book. Don't just believe me. Go to this book. And, <clears throat> and if I have gathered a meaning out of this book that I can't support scripturally, I need, I need to know that. I need you to tell me that. I believe you've been given a responsibility to make it known to me. On the other hand, verse 10, he that loves, and this is this is, this is a present participle. He that loves his brother abides in the light. You know, a present uh, participle normally indicates uh, that the action of that participle is concurrent with the main verb. So abiding in the light means loving our brother. The text says you can't separate those. If you're really in the word, if you're really in the light, which is God's word, the truth of his word, then you love your brother. And I don't believe it's possible to separate those. The, part of, the participle there is concurrent with the main verb, and that verb is a present tense. He's abiding in the light. From what we have seen in these few verses, it's clearly possible in these verses for one of God's children to be in the darkness or in the light. We're certainly not looking at, uh, well, we're seeing a believer and a non-believer here. That's not what we're seeing. Or we're seeing a, one who walks in the light. Now, I've come to walk in the light, so now I'll forever up to my last breath, till my last day on earth, I'm going to be walking in the light. That's, you know, because you've come to walk in the light, so now you're always going to walk in the light. Folks, that's not what it's saying you know, either, Okay. You know, it'd be nice if I guess if that were true, but it's not. That's not what it's saying. From what we've seen in these verses, it is absolutely clear that that these these verses clearly show that we can either walk in the darkness or we can walk in the light and i personally i think that's what the old man and new man does and folks i don't think that that ought to shock you i mean you've probably seen it a thousand times in your own life the word brother here is a brother in the lord he that is loving that brother is abiding in the light Looking at the last phrase, we see that there is absolutely no occasion of stumbling in him. The word stumbling there. The King, the King James Version seems to say that that, that, that guy abiding in the light is, is not going to stumble. I've, I've, I've got another idea that I'm going to put out here for you to think about. Yeah, it seems to imply that, you know, he's going to walk fine without stumbling. But I don't think that that's what the text says at all. I think the text says that if you're abiding in the light, then you're not a source of entrapment for other brethren because that's what the word stumble means. It's the word is the, 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 the stick bait in a trap. It's, it's, a, it's an interesting word. You Greek students, you know, if you want to take a look at that, uh, those of you who really like looking up the, the meaning of Greek words, it's not the grammar here we're looking at, it's the meaning of the word. And that's what the word stumble means. If you're abiding in the light, then you're not a source of entrapment for other 
brethren. And, and folks, that scares me. I mean, I think that says that if I'm really abiding in the light, if I'm really in the Word of God, then I'm not a source of entrapment for my brother, but there's a possibility that I can be. And the last thing in the world I want to be is a source of entrapment. When we get to the end of this chapter, we'll read the words, And now, little children, abide in Him, that when He shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. You know, and, and some people think that's all about their moral life. I'm convinced that the shame has to do with what we taught. And folks, I don't want to be a cause of entrapment in your life. With all of my heart, I want to direct you into this book. My teaching should drive you into this book. Not to sit back and relax thinking that, you well, you know, I, I kind of like what Steve said, so I don't have to study. I pray God strikes me dead before I'd be a cause of entrapment in your life. I love this book. I study it seriously, and I, and I rejoice in what I think it says, but I deeply know that no man is the source of all truth. I know that I've had the privilege of fellowshipping with, with some of what I think are the greatest Bible teachers I've ever known, and not with, with one of them do I have, am I in complete agreement, okay? You're not going to be always in complete agreement with me and vice versa, but we love one another. Why do, we, why do we love one another? Because that's all the new man can do. It's the new man walks in the light, not in darkness. I don't expect you to have complete agreement with me, but I love you if you don't. You have the Holy Spirit, and He'll lead you into all truth. I think you have believers walking in both light and darkness in the ninth and the 10th verses. That's what I believe. Yeah, I think there are Christians in, in both verses. Folk, folks, teach what you think the truth is, but don't be a case of entrapment. The cause of the stumbling in verse 10 appears to be that if I'm walking in the light, then I won't stumble theologically. I don't think that's what the word says. The Greek word is the bait in a trap. That's basically what the Greek word means. And, and if we're walking in the light, we won't be the bait in the trap. So we won't be causing those for whom our Lord died spiritual harm or perhaps even ruin. He that says he's in the light and hates his brothers in darkness even until now, he that loves his brother abides in the light. And there's no occasion of stumbling and trapping. There's no occasion of stumbling in him. New man. The word none there, if you have the authorized version, it is who may in the Greek. It's what I call the absolute negative. It is a strong not, okay? No way. Absolutely not. No way. Now, I, I recognize that, that there's got to be a, some of you out there that I'm sure there are, there are those of you who believe that, that he who hates his brother in verse 9 is, is a Christian who's not walking in the light. Uh, I'm going to suggest to you that I think we're talking to brother in Christ, that there are those that, that they're, I mean, we're looking at these, those who are new creations in Christ, but who be, because of the influence of the flesh, sometimes they hate others who are also new creations in Christ Jesus. That's what I think we're seeing here. I communicate with Christians every day that, you know, who I don't think uh, know very much about this book. I communicate with Christians who, who quote poems, actually, that are hymns, parts of the hymns or little quips of poems and stuff that, they're not verses of Scripture. They call it Scripture, but it's not Scripture. I don't hate these people. Maybe some of them hate me. I, I don't know. 
I personally believe that we are looking at the conflict between flesh and spirit. The theme of 1 John is the love of God and our love for each other. When we get to the next chapter, the very first verse, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Back in Ephesians chapter 2, the wrath of God comes upon the children of disobedience and a great number of Christians take those children of disobedience to be disobedient Christians do you really believe that? The God who present tense loves you. Not that he loved you. He loves you. Present tense. He died in order to make you righteous. I mean, do you really believe that his wrath is going to fall on you? If you do, then you don't understand propiti propitiation. I mean, it, if, if it's going to fall on you, then what in the world fell on Christ? But there's a conflict. Romans chapter 7, O wretched man I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I think that only becomes meaningful, you know, as you get older. Just look at the mess of old men in the scriptures. You know, it's wonderful to walk with the Lord. And, but the more that you learn of the Lord, the more you learn of his word, the more that conflict of flesh and spirit is there. He that says he's in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. I believe that is an indication of the conflict between flesh and spirit. I suggest that the one who's in darkness and hates his brother is a new creation in Christ where the flesh is dominating. Now, I want to I want to word this very carefully. Uh, I do not believe that your old man is ever commanded to do anything in the Word of God. If you're a new creation in Christ Jesus, that new creation does righteousness. It never does anything else. You, we will see that in the following chapter. And the Lord tried to illustrate that to, to his followers. You know, a good tree can't bring forth evil fruit. The evil tree can't bring forth good fruit. I'm going to tell you that 90% of the Christianity that I know, that I see, is geared to make your flesh bring forth good fruit. And it won't work. Folks, it cannot be done. When we look at the works of the flesh, you know, the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, you know, over in Galatians, and it, and it, and it goes on for, for several verses. You know, none of that junk is any good. And, you know, are you going to take that verse, those verses, and are you going to say, well, that's only true of those who are not Christians? You can't do that. All of you who are Christians, I mean, you don't have flesh. You know, we, we were just told, you know, let me remind you, he who says he has no sin, okay, don't say that you don't have sin. Ah, yeah, I ain't got all that. I ain't got no envyings, murderings. I never murdered anybody. I don't drink. I don't get drunk. I'm not a drunkard. You know, revelings and such like. It's it's the such like. That's what you have, folks. You look at the big ones and you say, well, I don't do any of that stuff. I'm pretty good. But you got the and such like. That's the flesh. And you're never going to know the peace of God that passes understanding. You're never, ever going to understand what it means that you are a son of God until you understand the finished work of Jesus Christ. Until you understand the grace of God. And folks, time is running out. I mean, imagine, imagine the Christians that couple works to the finished work of Christ. You know, it's becoming more and more popular by the minute. Four or five hundred years ago, we never had that problem. We had strong, conservative, biblical thought that ruled against that kind of heresy. Today, it's just the norm. It's predominantly taught that you have to accept Christ as your personal Savior. No verse of Scripture. 
Dearly beloved, there isn't a one of you that can support that from the Bible. Where's the verse of Scripture? You say, but Steve, you know, I think it's wonderful that we, we accepted Christ as our personal Lord and Savior. And I say to you, I think it's wonderful that Christ accepted you. That's what's wonderful. But there are great numbers of Christians who believe that we are redeemed by our personal faith in Christ and our production of good works, and they call that grace. But do we hate them? No, we don't hate them. They're our brothers and sisters in the Lord. We live in an earthen vessel, but in it we have a treasure. We have a new creation in Christ. Even they have a new, are a new creation in Christ. That new creation in Christ loves the brethren, and that new creation in Christ cannot, cannot sin, as we'll see in the next chapter. We're not asking which, which person are we here. Okay, you know, the one that loves or the one that hates. Or, you know, which one am I here? You know, the one that abides or the one who do doesn't, the one who's walking in the light, you know, the one who doesn't. As brethren, folks, I believe we are looking at both our old man and our new man, okay? And don't say that you have no sin. But I believe God is telling you that your new creation is a good tree, that it cannot bring forth evil fruit. We can't mix salt water and fresh water at the same time. It's not even possible to do that. You know, somebody quotes that verse and says, see, you know, we can mix salt water and fresh water. You know, but, but, you, but you have it coming from two separate sources. You mix salty water with fresh water, and what do you got? You got salty water. Just like a little leaven leavens a whole lump. Can't, can't happen. You're a good tree. You're a new creation in Christ. Can I somehow commend you into the grace of God, the God who loves you? You know, His love, you know, is as far as the heavens are above the earth. Love that's as eternal as God Himself. And the price paid for sin that, that can't be used up. You are a new creation in Christ. But, but ah, let me tell you, you live in a body of death. But you have the grand declaration of victory in Romans 7. Who shall deliver me? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And folks, dearly beloved, if you feel that you're under the guilt of sin, that you, then you haven't comprehended what Christ did. In Colossians chapter 3, For which things sake the wrath of God comes on the children of disobedience. And there's millions of Christians, millions who say, I'm a child of disobedience. The wrath of God is going to fall down on me. And they don't understand propitiation. If God is propitiated, well, I should say, since God is propitiated through the finished work of Christ, He cannot be angry with you. His wrath cannot fall on you. Folks, if you did an honest assessment of your life, there's a multitude of little, and you put those in quotes, little sins, you know, that seem inconsequential to you. Things that all Christians do. Everybody does that stuff. Everybody breaks the speed limit, whatever. You don't worry much about that stuff, but you got this big sin that where somehow you carry a great load of guilt and condemnation because of it. You know, if you love him, folks, you are aware that you sin, but you're not aware of any guilt. If you are, you don't understand what Christ has done for you. There aren't big sins and little sins. You know, if, if we comprehend what God has done for us, by becoming incarnate, becoming our kinsman, and dying in our place. We cannot die. We, we stand before Him spotless, guiltless. If we, if we don't do that, we don't, we don't understand. We, can't, we don't comprehend what He did. Anybody knows that the blood of bulls and, and goats can't do away with sin. But we know the blood of Christ did. And if you don't know that peace, if you don't know that rest, and you don't know that joy, 
Dig into this book. You are surrounded by a so-called Christian community that is forcing you to believe that it's up to you. God's done all he can, now it's up to you. Okay, I recognize God tells you to separate yourself from vessels of dishonor. Of course, nobody who really loves the Lord and comprehends what he's done for him takes pleasure in sin. You know, there's a big difference between being aware of the sin and carrying the guilt of the sin. You know, if you can in your minds, just, you know, go back to the Day of Atonement. You know, I've mentioned this before. You know, here you are. And, you know, Dad, what'd they do? Well, uh, the priest went in there all by himself and he offered an animal's uh, uh, atonement uh, uh, for our past sins last year. Well, what about next year? Well, we got a problem. You know, in the, in the minute we sin, we have guilt. We have to look forward to the Day of Atonement next year. And we do no work. We do no work. We do no work because God was teaching the nation, nation of Israel, His people, and, and teaching us through them, teaching them that to us that it's not by anything we do, but by the death of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's all about the death of the uh, innocent. You know, the innocent in place of the guilty, you know, just like Barabbas. Think about that. How how that a sovereign God knew knew how to design that circumstance, construct that circumstance to where that even uh, Bar Barabbas his name that was given him by his father was uh, the uh, I'll just look up the name meaning son of my father. But you have first, there's a lot there. You got the people crying out. They wanted Barabbas free. You know, it's, it's, it's amazing just in and of itself that, that God would give us the illustration of Barabbas, which I believe illustrates all of us as being, you know, where the guilty go free and the innocent suffer Christ in our place. You see redemption there in that. Uh, but the more you realize just how effective Christ's work was on your behalf, the more you're going to love Him. Walking in the light will not allow us to, to hate our brother because we're not always in agreement with one another. You know, because others aren't as smart as we are, you know. What we are being shown here, I believe, is the conflict between the flesh and the spirit, the old and the new man, which we'll soon see in the following chapter. Look, I'm out of time. I love you all. I truly do. I hope you are all well. We are so living in such uncertain times and i believe our lord is coming soon thank you for all of that you, that you do to help us here at blessed hope forever thank you for all your lovely comments until next time this is steve thanks for watching